Welcome to the Vigor Life Podcast, a source of inspiration, lessons, stories, skill sets, mindsets, and strategies to invigorate and expand all areas of your life. Let's go. What's going on? Coach Luca back here with the Vigor Life Podcast. And today I'm going to be talking about something that I'm passionate about. Oh, shit. I'm passionate about it now, I guess. Um, I wasn't when I sucked at it. Um, but that is speaking and presenting. And 10 big ideas. We're going we're gonna to be flip-flopping a little bit, but the, the, the gist of it will be the 10 like big ideas and 10, I would say, lessons and resources and, um, and improving your presenting. And uh, I mean, this can be in this day and age, that can be a lot of different things, meaning, you know, presenting is obviously also in front of the camera, in front of video. Um, but specifically, this is going to be more towards um, like truly presenting off of stage uh, events, speaking, things of that nature, um, which I think is such a missing link and ingredient in the success of, you know, whether you, whether you're a fitness business owner, you're a small business owner. If you are um, honestly like any type of business, like being able to clearly communicate and a big part of today also is going to be, you know, talking about telling stories, but like clearly communicate um, it, it is it is a superpower. OK, it is a superpower. And so I don't care who you are uh, as far as in the context of, you know, whether you're a business owner, whether you're somebody that works at a, at a company, whether, uh, you know, everybody wants to get their ideas shared or their ideas communicated. And so what I'm going to talk about today, that's what's going to help you out with that, right? It doesn't matter which area you're in and what you're doing. If you're able to present better, speak better, sell an idea, sell the story better, it will help you in your life. It will help you coach. It will help you sell. It'll help you um, like I said, when I say sell, it might help you sell to, to generate some type of revenue, but it, it also helps you sell an idea and sell a, you know, persuade an influence. So, um, you know, when I talk about this, sometimes it becomes, you know, people kind of block out because it's, oh, well, I'm not a presenter. I don't speak. And I'm like, you do every day you're on stage in some format of another or another. Um, but I'm going to start today off with some books because uh, there's a, like these are actually more storytelling books. Some of the ones that I enjoyed uh, and definitely got a lot out from. And some of these, I would say, notes are gathered from from the different books. Um, and uh, but there's 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 certainly a lot more. Honestly, I was just sitting here uh, thinking of off the top of my head just to share with you guys if you want to dive down this, because I think the art of storytelling is just so important. Um, and I'll give you, give you some tips about like, you know, how I do this every, every day, uh, even in the gym, like when I'm, when I'm, when we do our trainings and team trainings at the end, we're, I'm always sharing stories. I'm always presenting in some form format really. Um, and that would, that helps you. Uh, like I said, if you're, if you're talking to your kids, if you're, you know, sharing stories with friends, if you're like at work, I mean, obviously this, this all fits in, but here's some books and I'll, I'll put the links in it in the, um, in the, the notes section of the, of the podcast, but, um, the art of storytelling, easy steps to presenting an unfor unforgettable story from uh, John Walsh, uh, Ted talk, storytelling, 23 storytelling techniques by, uh, Akash Karya. And that, that one's like really short, really to the point. It cuts down to like 23 different techniques that the best in all the TED talks have used. Um, a really good one to just kind of carry with you and flip through. Um, storytelling with data by Cole Knopfler, uh, Pixar storytelling by Dean Moshevitz. And I've talked about Pixar as far as like, you know, talk about somebody that has to, uh, create an incredible story and has engaged us in, um, in their in their movies right uh, so definitely worth looking through that one this may be one of my favorite as far as like just cutting it down um and and a lot of the things i'm going to share today are from this one is talk like ted public speaking secrets from the world's top minds by carmen gallo who also um wrote the uh the speaking secrets of steve jobs which is a great book uh that i, I would certainly have you dig into that one as he was, uh, you know, I would say Apple, uh, success was definitely connected to the impact and the quality of Steve Jobs presenting and storytelling. So, um, there's another book called wired for story, um, uh, building a story brand by Donald Miller. I, I have a story to share about that. I'm actually, I've went through their courses. Uh, that's the, that's one of the marketing, uh, I would say, uh, 
foundations that I teach. Uh, and obviously, that's we, we could go deeper into that. My presentation at the Victory Round Summit last year was about uh, story brand. Um, whoever tells the best story wins. How to use your own stories to communicate with power and impact. Uh, sell with a story. How to capture attention, build trust, and close a sale by Paul Smith. So just some that you know you can kind of dive into. That's plenty. You got plenty of reading there for probably about a year. Um, but then implementing this stuff, right? So I, I wanted to share that just to. Sh- uh, give you an idea. Uh, if you're anything like me, I'd like to f- dig into the behind the scenes, in the trenches, the why. So when I find something out, I'm going to find all the topics on it and then study the, the crap out of them and apply them to really, really get good at this stuff. Uh, but you know, when, we, when it comes to presenting, and especially when it comes to storytelling, you know, it, apart from the fact that, like I said, that, that this was the preferred way of communication for thousands of years. Um, and they, why we're so wired for it, that's why that book was called Wired for Story, is there's a number of things that happen, um, I would say, that neurologically that, that make stories so powerful. I mean, one is something called neural coupling. So uh, the story activates part in the brain that allows the listener to turn the story into their own ideas and experience uh, thanks to a process called neural coupling. Right, so it's like you actually are experiencing more. It becomes visual, becomes uh, it's something that you feel. Uh, number two is like dopamine. So the brain releases dopamine into the system when it experiences an emotionally charged event, making it easier to remember and with greater accuracy. And we've talked about this, like how the amygdala remembers things, or should I say, how how our brain remembers things as emotionally charged events, which could be, you know, uh, I would say sometimes painful. But sometimes, you know, what do you remember, right? You remember your wedding. You remember 9-11. You remember, like, uh, death. You remember birth. You remember, like, these, these emotionally charged events. And so same thing with stories. Like, if a story makes you feel, and because a story makes you feel, it makes you remember. So that's what's powerful about it versus just giving some data, right? Uh, another thing is mirroring, that listeners will not only experience the similar brain activity to each other, but also to the speaker. So if I'm passionately sharing a story with you about my own life, my own experience, or maybe about somebody else's, but I'm, I'm really like uh, relaying that, you start feeling the emotion. And if you've gone to the movies, how many times have you laughed, cried, you know, exploded out of your seat because it was... It was, you know, um, exciting, right? And it's like, it's because we connect to that story. And also like cortex activity, when processing facts, two areas of the brain are activated. Broca's and Wernicke's area. A well-told story can engage many additional areas, including the motor cortex, sensory cortex, and frontal cortex. So there's so much cortex cortex activity when when a story is being told. And, you know, this. I, I guess that it's important to... Um, to explain some uh, somewhat that you know why that happens because a story compels a human brain the same way a puzzle uh, or a riddle intrigues us, right? Because we, we want to solve it, right? And, and, and a story is a series of questions. If those questions are relevant, asked well and asked in the right order, they'll keep a person interested. And that's what a great story does or, or a great presentation because like I said, I'm going to start moving into the presentation part of it. Um, and so with that said, I'm just going to flip through my notes here real quick, get into it. There we go. Um, you know, why is this important, I guess? Why, why is this important to you? Why is this important to anybody? Well, it's because you have ideas, great ideas, I hope. I, I believe everybody has great ideas inside of them, right? But unfortunately, unless you can engage an audience in your delivery of those ideas, they'll never leave your head. And I think many people are scared or not confident in the communication part of those ideas, and that's why they never come out. At some point, you're gonna have to speak publicly, period. Whether it's work, presentations, uh, seeking startup capital in front of a group, a panel, uh, for fun, if you choose. I mean, there's so many different, but you, but you are going to have to do it. And, and I was definitely afraid of this stuff. Actually, when I was, uh, you know, when I when I came to college, one of the things in the U.S. that they do that don't do as much in Slovenia is having to do presentations in front of the class, like presenting projects and and things of that nature. And man, I was always be shaking doing that. I was like, it just I, that was not my thing because now people are like, oh, you're so good at this stuff. Um, but it's like thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of of deliberate practice 
um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of speaking engagements. Well, actually, I, I, I said too many hundreds. <laughs> They're getting carried away. But I would say like a couple hundred if, if I'm counting all the ones at the gym uh, that I've done absolutely, you know, in thousands of videos. So it's certainly been a lot of work. Uh, and, you know, why is it also important is because the ability to com communicate effectively has become one, one of the, if not the most sought after skill uh, in job applicants, candidates, uh, I would say, you know, our presenters, like if, if you will always have an advantage if there's two people with a, a similar skill set and competence of a, of a something that you do. So let's say for me, it's it's coaching, right? It's either fitness coaching or business coaching. And if if you're close there, but one person has better communication and presentation skills, game over. Easily, this person is going to excel more. Okay, so that's why this is so important with you. And you know, with with that said, um, we're gonna move into some of the big idea stuff. But before we do, like, think about it this way. Um, you know, think about the last time that somebody moved you. Okay, think about the last presentation. Uh, that you went to and it could even be like a video it could have been online it could have been you know uh, it, it didn't necessarily have to be face to face although I definitely think that face to face speaking is much more powerful but think about that and Matt like close your eyes and then think about what happened in that moment right did you get fired up did you buy their product did you find out more about them did it did it drive you to take some action right like you too can do that it's not like, you know, it's not a one, two, three trick pony type of thing that it's like after this, you're just going to be able to do it. Um, but you have that capability, right? You have, you have some type of value and skill set that you can give to the world. This is the bridge a lot of times. A lot of times the communication, the storytelling is the bridge from those ideas, those things that are inside of you to, you know, making shit happen. And a great story for, for, for me is like that I read long, long, long time ago was from uh, was about Tony Robbins, you know, how he started speaking at a young age and became successful faster. And, you know, uh, it was some type of course that they were going through and they were learning about obviously presenting, about speaking and things of that nature. Um, and the mentor slash teacher was like, hey, you know, the more frequently you speak, the better you're going to get at it. You know, the more constructive criticism you get, the more you can kind of uh, reflect and, and uh, evaluate how you're doing it and improve, right? And kind of course correct. And so a lot of his, I would say, peers were, you know, scheduling, you know, one speaking gig a, a week, sometimes one every couple of weeks, uh, which, you know, can seem pretty frequent. But Tony Robbins ended up doing like five or six or seven, like pretty much every day of the week, he was just hustling to get in front of people. So if you look at a year's time, right? And Let's say that one person spoke once a week. That's 52 uh, speaking engagements, which is a lot, right? It's a lot. But Tony Robbins would do six a week. Right now, that's 300, okay? And I might be off on the numbers, but I, legitimately, that's the story that like he was doing it every, almost every day. And so now you're getting more deliberate practice in faster. So that's how you get better. So to me, like some of these things that I'm sharing with you guys is like, hey, how, how can you, you know, to, when you listen to this podcast today, the next thing that you do. And, and the thing is presenting is not necessarily in front of, you know, thousands of people. I'm, I'm presenting, you know, after I get done with the training session of a group, I'm spending five, sometimes 10 minutes speaking. Right? I'm, I'm sharing stories and ideas. I want to I want to get things inside of my 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 uh, I will say my tribe's head and sometimes help, you know, uh, break up their belief systems that they have and and take on new beliefs that will help them achieve the goals that they want to achieve. Sometimes I want them to suspend a disbelief. Right. Suspend disbelief and give this opportunity for for this new perspective that would actually help them move forward. Right. And the thing is, but I do that through communication. I do that through speaking. I do that through storytelling. And so every day is an opportunity for you to actually do this. And right? when you look at it like that, now all of a sudden, hey, you got 365 days a year to practice this deliberately. OK. So one of the big ideas is that, you know, the ideas are currency. So everyone sells. I've, I've said this before, right? We're in the age of disruption and the age of infinite technological possibility. Uh, I mean, shit, the, the age of sending cars into space simply because we can't. How can you possibly expect to get recognized when such wild cultural, economic, and technological innovations are taking place each day, right? And 
Remember that you don't need to be born or shower with high-powered connections, access, unlimited resources. In fact, all you need can be found within you right now. You just need ideas. Actually, you need one idea, right? And that's the currency of the 21st century. Now, I've said before, ideas are not enough, okay? Because your idea may be a brilliantly engineered product that solves a widespread problem. You see, maybe you see a bug in a, in a system. Maybe you see a new way of doing stuff. Um, and you, you may have an inspirational vision of how the future of communication, transportation, innovation, coaching, business, right? But whatever your idea, you must, like you absolutely must be able to present it effectively. If, if you can't, like game over, right? The world wants your ideas, like it actually it needs your ideas. Um, and, but, but if you look at places like the arena venture capital, uh, you know, how can you sell a word changing idea through, you, you have to sell it through a clear, engaging and urgent presentation and otherwise it's not gonna happen, right? Otherwise it could just gets tossed in a bucket. And I think that's part of the, uh, the I would say, sometimes problem is that like people have great ideas and how many times have you you know looked back and go like oh man i had that that idea and then somebody executed it right and maybe it was that first they communicated really well and then they got support for it and then they executed well right so so uh, i i talked about steve jobs before and and he was renowned for leading the charge of making like computing personal with apple obviously uh but maybe owes a lot of his fame to his ability to present Right. So if you think about moments from his product reveals, including pulling you know, an iPad Nano from his tiny pant pocket or fitting a MacBook in a manila envelope, uh, you know, those, all those went viral. Right. And it was all like presenting stuff. That's why, like I said, Carmen Gallo that uh, wrote The Presenting Secrets of Steve Jobs. It's a great book to go through uh, as far as, you know, how he did those things. OK. Uh, and also, if you know, if you haven't watched this, certainly do, because it's. His um, Stanford University commencement speech is considered one of the most inspirational of all time, right? He, he truly was and continues to be one of the most inspirational individuals of our century. And a lot of that was because of his presenting skills. And you think about it, right? Like, that, think about the, the um, think about what would have happened, right, if he didn't present that great or if he, he wasn't a great storyteller, you know, it, would things be the same? I don't know. I, but I certainly know that uh, the people that you remember are usually great communicators. And remember, so, you know, my quote for this is like that there's nothing more inspiring than a bold idea delivered by a great speaker. So as, as always, like I'm going to try to ask some questions here to give you some insight. And this is where like, you know, hey, if you, if you pause it and jot this stuff down so you actually take actionable stuff out of it, that's when you're winning. You know, listening through this is cool. But hey, if you take action, that's when you get better. And that's, and that's what I really care about. That's what this, this whole podcast is about. It's like sharing this stuff so that you take action and you become better tomorrow than you are today. So what's your big idea? Like write it down, but also stand where you are or, or, uh, and speak it as if there was an audience. And make sure that it makes sense when you express it verbally. So many times, I talk to so many people that are like are literally scared to express their idea. And a lot of times it's because, hey, you know, like, the think, thinking is like, oh, it's, it's embarrassing. Ah, nobody will care. Or maybe somebody's done it before or whatever it may be. Right. And you got to learn to start putting ideas out there. Actually, James Altucher was one of the people that um, I would say I got this from and, and do it almost every day. I did it for every day for a long time. Actually, if you look at my phone and my um, I would say the reminders that pop up every day because it's a daily reminder is write out 10 ideas. Um, every day, write out 10 ideas. Write them for yourself, write them for others. So I write ideas for friends, um, meaning like, hey, I think it would be great if you did da 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 Hey, your skill set is dope. Have you ever thought about doing it, right? Like, and so I write those out, but why? Because it helps me generate ideas, right? When you practice generating ideas, guess what? Your brain becomes better at generating ideas. And some of the ideas are just dumb, and it's like, that's fine, that's okay. It doesn't matter. Like, you know, people are like, oh man, but. Should I just write ideas even if they're not great? Just write them down. The goal is to, to, to write ideas so that you get better at generating ideas, not just so that all the 10 ideas are great, okay? So think about also, you know, the, the, the second part is think about when has someone else persuaded you to join your cause or to support something simply from a speech or a presentation, right? What aspects of them and their presentation worked on you? Well, let me tell you something. This is, this is a great story. I was at Traffic Conversion Summit. This is probably like two years ago now. Uh, maybe a little bit more. I, it's two or three years ago. I'm at Traffic Conversion Summit. One of the keynote speakers is Donald Miller. Donald Miller, at that point in time, I kind of heard a little bit about them, but not much. And um, 
and he talks about this presentation about the how they they create marketing, which is the story brand model. And uh, I mean, I shit you not, like I'm like this is one of the best presentations I've ever heard. I walk out, I buy you know multiple thousand dollar uh, product slash course, and ended up continuing to buy stuff from them for multiple thousands of dollars uh, because it was that good. And and like you know when when I asked myself that question, what did I do? Well, he was essentially telling a story about how to tell stories and market. And I went and bought that so that I could also do it that well. And I've been practicing ever since. So perfect example of right. But, you know, ask yourself, when has somebody persuaded you? Right. Uh, also, watch some of Steve Jobs presentations as well as some of the more famous TED Talks. That that was one. I, I, I've watched hundreds and hundreds of TED Talks. And like when new ones come out, I keep watching. I actually keep listening to them too on my podcast uh, or some of my podcasts as well because like I just want to get really, really good and, and looking at what they're doing. So think about like when you watch those TED Talks, what about them inspired you, right? What moments stuck the most? Become, you know, like, like I said, you got you to deliberately practice this stuff. You got to watch people doing it. The second big idea is that passion is contagious and, um, and, and passion earns capital, I want, you to, I want you to stop there for a second and just take this now. Passion earns capital, right? You've heard it a million times before. Follow your passion, right? If you're not passionate about your job and career, you're unlikely to find success at it. If your relationship lacks passion, it probably won't last. I think that's, I think that's a pretty, pretty safe thing to say. So if you present on something that doesn't fill you with passionate zeal, you aren't going to connect with your audience, period, right? So this last claim has actually been demonstrated scientifically on several accounts, Perhaps the most significant study we've done uh, where money was at stake was from between 2006 and 2010. It was from professors at Northeastern University and Chapman University. And basically, they observed that the decision-making process of angel investors was uh, from 241 presentations that gave funding to 41. They noticed that basically one of the three things that played the most uh, uh the, the, the most decision-making of who they were giving it to is perceived passion. It was in the top three, right? P- passion played a bigger role in getting funding than did commitment, preparedness, and even experience. Now, I'm going to run this back a little bit because passion is very important, but I will say this. And, um, you know, one of my friends that's, that's kind of, I would say, struggling right now with figuring out what they're passionate about. Um, and I legitimately, you know, we're, we're, we're texting back and forth. And I said, listen, man, you got to stick with something long enough to, you know, to, to start figuring shit out, okay? And I think this is, it goes for a lot of people, right? They start something, they're at a job for a couple of weeks, maybe a month, and they're like, I don't know, man. Like, it's not for me. And they keep hopping, right? And while I agree with the whole passion, I, I also am a big believer in uh, not following the passion hypotheses, meaning that, like, you become passionate about stuff the harder you work at it and the more uh, career capital you build at it. Okay, so I mean, and you know what? This is going to be a perfect example. Was I passionate about speaking? Fuck no, absolutely not. I was scared of it. I was afraid. Like, how am I? You know, I didn't feel like I was good at it. Right now, the better I became at it, like now people are like, "Man, are you passionate about speaking?" Absolutely. Every day, I'm like, "Man, I mean, it's like this is how I am all the time." Like, you come into the gym, I'm like fired up. I'm t- trying to talk to people. I'm, I'm, I'm always. I feel like presenting. Right, like. And so, because I became better at it, I talked, I told a story about like, was I passionate about basketball? No, like I sucked. I was a small kid. Nobody picked me. I was, I I felt like angry. I was angry because it's like I was picked on and hey man, like you're the short kid. You sucked. Oh man, we got to pick you. I got angry. I practiced hard, right? Because I wanted to prove myself. I had a chip on my shoulder. As I became better, I became more passionate about it. So I do want to frame, like I want to, I want to say that because, uh, you know, as, 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 it's the same thing I told my friend. I said, listen, man, like stick with it for a year, for two years, right? Be, be, like the thing is, even if this is not your thing, you're going to build a skill set. You're going to get better at it, right? You're going to learn how to learn, right? You're going to learn how to practice, which is a massively important skill. And so with that said, I wanted to zoom out of that and like let you guys know and be like, hey, don't think that you're going to run into something and be like, I fucking love this. And then just keep doing it. And like, you know, everything's phenomenal. Like, that's not how it works. But what I will say is that whatever you stick with, and it's like if you're passionate about a subject, that's what's going to happen. Now, you know, 
uh, this is a great way to to think about this. Like some, some is a saying you may have heard it before. Like what makes your heart sing? Okay, um, and we've established kind of that a lack of passion in the workplace is dangerous. Uh, but you don't exactly have to be passionate about what you do directly, right? Rather, in most cases, one true passion is in the fulfillment of a deeper human need. So this is a thing to think about as well. So Allah, I think Maslow's here can need. So uh, when when they spoke with the CEO of, of Starbucks, Howard Schultz, which I should definitely know because Starbucks is from Seattle, uh, and, and I've, I've read all the books about it, uh, and he discovered that Schultz's passion was not about serving great coffee, or any product at all, actually. He, he, he was the first person that created it. His goal is to create the third place, right? So in addition to people's homes and workplaces where they felt comfortable and served well, the ultimate goal of Starbucks is one of service, safety, and community. In a sense, these are the fundamental products of the highly successful chain cafe and not pumpkin spice lattes or chocomoca focus or whatever the hell they call them, right? And that actually, that was a big, you know, Alan Cosgrove was one of the first people that I, you know, I'm, uh, also learned from got mentored a long time ago that said hey you know make your gym the third place and i've certainly took that to heart and you know even the evolution of vigor ground the way that it is now where we do have you know a fit bar cafe and a lounge area and all these different things that that we we've worked on and are continuing to work on is to make it that right so for instance if you've ever been in your late teens early 20s you've probably been asked by an eager relative right what, what do you want to do what's your passion and this question has become rather com- common place. I'm eating my words right now. I think I need a little bang. Mm. And um, I would, and, and this is where you kind of, I would have you consider asking yourself an alternative, and especially if you're still on the quest to find your purpose. And, and once again, you know, coming back to purpose, I've I mentioned it before. Purpose is not found; it's forged. But a great question. To answer that is, what makes your heart sing? Now, now you're asking about a tangible, all by like personified act, singing, but it carries some emotional significance. I ask yourself, what makes your heart sing? So if you're, de- if you're expected to deliver a public speech, you better ask yourself about the topic. Does this make my heart sing? If you can't find a yes somewhere in your rationale for taking on this task, you're probably gonna stand on the stage you know, in a head of conference and like fall flat. Um, and while, while your audience kind of expects a perfect pitch. And so, you know, pun intended with that one. But also, um, like many, many, many years ago, I don't know which, which conference I was at, but like Frank Kern was talking and it was one of those things that like, you know, somebody could, like all these things that I'm sharing with you as far as how to, when we get into like, uh, you know, the art of storytelling and, and putting together a great presentation, and you could hit all the points, but be like, not be passionate, not have a gusto for it, right? And people could tell. And even though you did all the things right, because uh, for, I think Frank called call it your sub- subconscious talking to my subconscious, and it just didn't didn't gel, right? You could tell, like, man. And I've been I've been at uh, events where I'm like, man, he's doing all the right things, but there's just something missing, right? The gusto, the aura, the passion. You could you could call it whatever you want. And so I think that's why. I think that's why, um, you know, th- this is a very important one, right? Because great speakers can't wait to share their ideas, right? Like m- when I'm going on, like, I can't wait to share. Honestly, like, you know, one of the things that people always say is like, man, you only got an hour of shit. Like, how are you going to do that? You usually got so much to say. And it's very true. Um, so with, with that said, I got a couple questions exercises for you, right? So number one, what makes your heart sing? And this is, you know, this one might take some time. Like, man, like write it, write it down somewhere and like come back to it. Uh, very rarely, like, look, you know, the purpose of life is living life and figuring it out. Like meaning comes through living life. But I, I you know, it, do you ask yourself that question often enough to really truly think about it? Um, and, you know, you go where your focus goes. And I find a lot of people that like, when I ask them that question, like they're so like, they've, it's almost like they've never been asked that they never really thought about it, you know? And that may may start the beginning of something where they're trying to figure it out. Um, when, it, when it comes to, you know, spreading like what you're passionate about, hey, ask the loved one to be your audience. Like st- simply stand in front of that person while they sit and explain to them the thing about what you're passionate about as well as why. Uh, it's a great drill. Choose a hobby or an activity you enjoy and speak naturally without preparation. 
And uh, I'm always like this, record yourself as possible and ask for feedback, right? I mean, uh, that was one of the things like me and Jay do a lot of uh, is, you know, we're, we're, we're a lot uh, around each other a lot when we're speaking. And after every speaking engagement, it's like, hey, how to do what you think? Uh, and we'll just be, you know, constructive. We'll, we'll, we'll have constructive criticism, but also like, hey, that was great. I thought you did a better job here. Um, I still think this was like this, that, and the other. But man, I love that. Like, that's the only way I can I can get better. Uh, Martin was also a person that that mentored me a lot through, uh, I would say, pr- presenting. Who and you know, I would say he's one of the greatest presenters in fitness, um, of, probably of all time. Uh, and being around him, you know, seeing him present 70, 80 times now, and he'd, he'd give me feedback. And over the years, I would just improve because I take that and continue to implement it in the things that I do. Um, and so then, and, you know, in the mock speech about your passion, how did you sound? What was your tone like? How was your body language like? Uh, your pace? Did you sound confident and assertive? And you will sometimes find people that have, haven't really done a lot of, uh, I would say, studying how to present and but yet do a great job because they're passionate about it and they're just trying to relay this information across to you right because they just want to get it out and so you know once again you could know all the checkpoints and the checklist but but not be passionate about it and guess what it's not gonna work right the big idea is number three is tell a story now, I think I actually story revolves pretty much around everything that we're talking about in this presentation. But think of story as data with a soul, which is a book that I mentioned also at the beginning <clears throat> that, I, that, I, that I enjoyed, right? So the impact of narrative and communication can't be emphasized enough, right? Human beings make sense of the experience through narrative. Stories are the lens through which our brains translate sensory information because it's been done for so long. Again, science has shown the significance of storytelling when it comes to human communication. Um, if, if you guys heard of uh, Uri Hassan, who was a Princeton psychology professor, performed brain scans on people who were telling and listening to stories. He discovered the brain activity of the listeners actually mirrored that of the tellers, creating a sort of coupling of mind meld that resulted in deep social connection. Now, I mentioned this at the beginning, but think about how powerful that is, right? Like, when somebody shares their story with you, you actually connect with them. You can build, you can help people with, I would say, compassion and empathy through great storytelling. Uh, Brene Brown, who I'm, I'm a huge fan of, I read all her books, and I would strongly have you consider uh, doing that. It's a phenomenal. So she's a professor from the University of Houston whose TED Talk has been viewed nearly 10 million times, once described stories as data with a soul. Ultimately, this is the point of anecdotes, to demonstrate the significance of a statistic or phenomenon without reducing its subjects to numbers or points on a graph to avoid removing their souls, right? Because you have, like, there's a lot of great data. And how many times have you, you know, I say, listen to somebody talk, and there's a lot of great data points, but it doesn't make you feel anything, right? Just the data doesn't make you feel anything, but the story is what helps you take that and make it emotional, Okay. So affirming identity. So there's three kinds of stories that hit home particularly well during presentations. Stories about yourself, story about, stories about others, and stories about brands and businesses. Uh, I always really strongly encourage everybody to share their story more. And um, when I was on a Sean Model, uh, the Model Health show and, and with Sean, like uh, in a lot of other areas, I've, I've started sharing, one, my story a lot, but also encouraging people to share theirs because those things connect people and they're powerful. And you have so many stories, you know, and, and I think many people are like, oh man, I don't really have any stories, but you do. Everybody has a story. Everybody has thousands of stories that they can relate a point to. Uh, and if, if you're an owner of a business or gym owner or uh, anything like that, man, I strongly encourage you to start sharing more of that, okay? Because people will be, if, think about it. Like, I mean, think about rapport building, right? Finding something that you're connected to. It's like, oh, man, I was divorced, too. Oh, man, that happened to me, too. Oh, man, I grew up here, and I did, you know, I was in the streets and doing this, that, and the other, too. Like, you connect through that, okay? So, in each case, there naturally develops traditional features of narrative plot, protagonist and antagonist, right? Not always people, okay? Not always people. There's a conflict. There's a struggle, and a resolution in which your protagonist becomes the hero and triumphs. And this is part of the reason why I love Story Brand, you know, uh, and that's, which is also a book, uh, Story Brand by Donald Miller. You can ch- check it out. Um, 
because by offering this story of the hero, listeners are invited to identify with another, right? With a data point that has a soul. So identity plays an inevitable role in how audience responds to presentation. If certainly like look this one up, go watch it. It'll be worth your time, I promise you. The longest ovation in the history of TED Talks belongs to Brian Stevenson. So he's a civil rights lawyer who has argued in one cases at the US Supreme Court level. He thrives on telling stories of himself. And uh, what has to do with his grandmother telling him he was special at a young age, an account of his good judgment and resistance to temptation. Turns out she said this to all the family, uh, all the family kids, but only Stevenson managed to take the message to heart and resist the temptation to drink alcohol in his adult life. Um, certainly not my story, as I do like a good uh, Moscow mule, but I digress. Back to the point. So this determined his identity, right? And it was done through story and used that experience to connect with his audience, who all likely received some wisdom or direction from an elder at some point in time, right? So remember that we are all natural storytellers, but somehow we lose this part of ourselves when we enter the corporate world or you know, we, we go into the real world and blah, 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 right? But naturally we're all storytellers because the thing is like how many times have you gone for a drink uh, or just gone out and you meet with friends like, and you got a story to tell? Like you can do it, you're already doing it. I think it's just creating uh, you know, a little more context to it and obviously organizing it in a way that now you can present in different, I would say, um, in different areas, okay? So a couple questions, exercises. So what is particularly poignant uh, story about your life experience? Can you relate that to your passion? Find a way to do so. Now I've shared my story quite a lot and like how I went from, you know, uh, I would say doing dumb shit in crime uh, and how basketball was a huge part of my life uh, and actually, you know, helped me, like helped I me. Mean, I, I would say one, discover myself, build skill sets, you know, get away from crime but also led me to fitness and you know how I ended up getting here to being a coach now for you know almost a decade and a half. Um, it comes from that, right? So, but hey, what's, what is your story about your life experience, right? Share, like whether it's writing it out, whether it's sharing it with someone. Again, this is another time when you like enlist an audience of somebody that you love, a friend, tell a story to them without preparation. See if you can include the basic characters and plot devices of a good narrative and it should happen naturally. Right? And once again, like the, the tendency for most people is just to go like, oh man, like there's no way I can do it. Like I, 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 you overthink it. Just start, just start telling the story. Just tell the story, right? You, there's, you can't go wrong if you just do it. Um, and so what's your favorite story? Maybe a book perhaps, uh, you know, Alchemist, one of the, certainly one of the greatest one by, by, by Paulo Coelho, but it's like, man, it, 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 that's a book I reread, try to reread every year. Um, but maybe it's something told to you by an older relative from childhood. What, you know, why do you love it? Can you, can you pull it out? Why do you love it? Um, can you pick out the essential story features? And uh, one of the things I actually like asking people is like, what's your favorite movie? Because when people say which, what their favorite movie is, it's like, oh, why is that, right? There's usually the underlying theme. Maybe it's romantic. It's about true love. Uh, like, I love The Last Samurai because it's about, it is, it's about, Love, it's about discipline of building, being um, truly purposeful about improving a skill and craft. And it's about, about honor and it's about loyalty, right? Things that really matter to me a lot, right? So, and I, and the thing is, somebody asked me that question and I found out, found out like why, why that, you know, that matters to me so much, right? But perfect example, why did that story touch you? Why does it matter to you so much? Um, Bigger idea number four is a multi-sensory experience, right? Showing and telling. And this is, this is where if you go watch TED Talks and if you go watch some of the best presentations, like how it all happens and pulls together, right? So we've all heard the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? So, well, when it comes to presentations and speeches, this expression is especially true. So, in fact, it has been determined that presentations delivered exclusively verbally get listeners to remember only about 10% of information on average. Only 10 and I've, I've actually talked about this learning model about how you remember more and, and uh, uptake more, right? So, but as soon as the inclusion of pictures in the same presentation uh, is, is there, it increases the retention to 65%. That's crazy, right? Crazy. Um, so that's a seriously huge leap. So don't ignore the impact of pictures. Um, 
and not not doing too much text. Like that's another one uh, that I I used to fall flat on. I'm I'm doing better with that now, right? Having pictures and then being able to talk through that. So so while it's important to include visuals, though, try to avoid putting text on your slides, right? This is one of the things that like you know when you have a lot to say and. You want to have all these bullet points and reminders. You want to be careful about that. And that's why if you look at TED Talks, right, they're short. Man, you can't be putting too much of that in there. So even though numbers and words can be quintessential to communicating your idea, it's always possible to find a creative way to express your point. Uh, Hans Rosling, a, a statistician, oh man, I got that word right. Yes, uh, was determined to be one of the most influential science educators of 2012 by Time Magazine. So, but this was mostly because of an exceptional TED Talk in which he creatively displayed an infographic. You got to go watch it. It's really, really cool. Rather than simply telling his audience about how global fertility rates have changed over the last 50 decades, he created an intuitive bubble graph with data points that moved in accordance with the year to data. And he narrated, so he narrated, he told a story about the motion like a sportscaster of sorts, like like ESPN-ish, creating an unforgettable moment for his audience. Okay, so perfect examples of gelling, I would say visual and also verbal. So in more senses, so if possible, and it almost always is, right? Almost always is. Get your audience to participate in your presentation through the sense of touch, smell, taste as well. So these may not be immediately relevant where large scope data makes up the majority of your idea or argument, but there's plenty of ways to get them involved. Right, so simply give them a notepad with specific instructions for exercises, note taking, or even some coll- collaborative workshops. This is why I think that you know also the future of some of the events and some of the stuff that I want to do is, you know, collaborative workshops where people like they listen to stuff, they see stuff, and then they go do it because they take more from it. And uh, you know, if you do that halfway through, you're keeping fully engaged and think about purpose. So anybody that was out at the Vigor Ground Summit, you know that like what what Krebsy did after every presentation people would get up find a partner walk and talk and share the thing that they learned what was the one thing that they took away from from the uh, uh from that presentation actually matter of fact afterwards people would write it down so we'd ask them to write down what they learned what's the one lesson what's the one lesson that they took away and what are they going to do about it to implement it right so they wrote that down and then got up found a partner walked and talked we call it the walk and talk Walked around this huge conference room, which was 180, 200 people, walked around and shared that. Now, that ingrained it more, and every time we'd have them switch it up so they wouldn't go with the same person. So now you're meeting somebody else, you're sharing your ideas, you're engaging. Much different, much, much different. So you could do, remember, you could do this if you have a small business, if you have a team meeting, you could do this, right? Don't, don't just think like these are applicable things in everything. Um, so here's another example at a biannual publishing sales conference. Astronomer and textbook author Stacy Palin demonstrated some ways she keeps her students engaged to the sales team of WW Norton, and she distributed rubber bands and paper clips and instructed everyone in the room to attach the clips next to each other on the band. Then she had everyone stretch the rubber band, pointing out how each clip gets further away from the adjacent two. Thus, she explained the perpetual expansion of space using two simple office tools. That's pretty, that's pretty, I would say, significant and dope. But imagine like how that person that's doing it now understands it or how they can explain it to somebody else, right? But with such a grandiose yet simple visual and tactile, right? Tactile, you feel an explanation. It captivates both boring salespeople and students, right? Like, which is, which is kind of like a wow moment for sure. But you can do that and you can see how stuff that for most people would be like, ugh, Ah, this is not interesting. You can make it interesting, right? Taking your audience on a journey with pictures, you paint in part art and part science is powerful, right? And it's like, ask yourself, how can I do this? So if you're doing a presentation, like how can you make things clear like that to people? So ask yourself this, does your big idea feature data? How do you usually explain this data? Can you do some more, uh, some more, something more creative by comparing it in size or scope or something that's more visually accessible, or something that might people might understand a little bit better, right? And there's like you can you can do it in fun ways, uh, you can do it in powerful ways that make people go like, oh, holy shit, right? That makes it makes it more relevant to them. Okay, At, like what can you give to your audience to get them physically involved in your presentation? 
It may be as simple as a notepad, but how can you ensure that you're using the notepad in a way that gets them thinking more about your idea? And like that was an example that I just gave from the Vigor Ground Summit that we did. Um, what exercise or workshops can you have your audience do with each other? Think about getting them up and moving to keep their energy high, right? So there's, there's nothing like, you know, there's, I know that if you've ever been in a conference for 8, 10, 12 hours, you know, the worst thing you can do, like, you know, two thirds of the way through, your brain is melted if you're not doing stuff. Right. So whether it's like setting it up in groups and sharing what you've learned, uh, having some type of activity, having to move around. So that's powerful. And it's something to definitely think, think about that you can do even right now in your business and your team meetings. Big idea number five is stick to the rule of three. This is actually really powerful. People miss this one. Um, I certainly was a person that did not follow this rule until probably like three years ago. Uh, but. You know, paying attention has become abundantly clear that the average attention span of humans has decreased over the ages, especially, you know, with, I would say, internet and digital media, right? So TED Talks formats acknowledge that most people are no longer enthusiastic about 60 or 90 minute university-like lectures, so the creators have imposed a soft time limit of 18 minutes per presentation. I feel kind of guilty right now, even doing this podcast, because as I read that, I'm like, man, I'm, I'm... I'm trying to suck your attention for an hour, maybe a little more, more than an hour and something like this, which is powerful. The cool thing is that you can stop it, you can start it, you can write stuff down. I actually ask you those questions to encourage you to do stuff, but that's why TED Talks have become so, so successful, right? Now, you may feel that your ideas may deserve more than 18 minutes. I always do, and yet at the same time, this has been a big challenge for me as I'm working on a TED Talk, uh, that uh, on, a, on a TEDx talk that I'm, uh, hopefully going to get on eventually I will period so that's that's unquestionable it's just whether, whether it will be um, beginning of next year well so just think about this right uh, should you know should you have more than 18 key points to express well they can and they should but just not during a presentation so instead of fighting go with what works three stories and 18 minutes are ideal for for modern human attention and educational energy find a way to distill things accordingly what's cool is that like you know I, I've started thinking about this because, okay, if I have something that I want to share, can I cut it down into three stories in 18 minutes? Uh, and sometimes it's not possible. Uh, you know, right now I'm working on end of September doing a, a, a single day of business coaching with a 30 day follow up uh, of coaching here at Vigor Ground. So having people fly in, do a whole day of how we do stuff here. Um, and guess what? You know, something like that tough to distill into 18 minutes and three stories, but like your main idea is I, I challenge you to work on this TED format because it really makes you clarify your message. Um, environmentalist major uh, Carter gave a TED talk on green infrastructure and entrepreneurship in which she told the stories of three people. The first was a woman who hired unlikely workers like former prisoners to create honey-based skincare products. You got to check this out. It's an incredible story. The second was a Los Angeles man who worked to get empty asphalt lots in his city replaced by planted greenery. And the final was a coal miner who introduced wind energy to her town. So there was a strong entrepreneurial connection on each of these characters, and Carter used this to highlight the potential of an economically and environmentally sustainable future. So she took, you know, she cut it down and said, okay, how can I take these three stories and make this a powerful point and idea in these 18 minutes? Remember, three is everywhere. Uh, actually, in story brand, like that's one of the things is like that when you, you know, this is more than I can cover here, but it's what I, I also consult on and, and, and coach on in, 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 my, uh, in the business coaching that I do of websites and, and, and all of your information to be distilled down into three steps, five at most, but preferably three. Uh, you know, step one, step two, step three, what's going to happen? Make it simple for the person that's reading your content to be able to, to, to visually like go like, oh, okay. These are the three steps that I got to go through, right? So again, you may feel that three is a small number for communicating an epic and important idea. I mean, shit, like that's one of the things I'm like, how do I distill this? Like that's one of my tough things to do. But guess what? You can trust science on this one too. Much research has been done on how the brain consumes new information. There has been, uh, there's long been a rule that claims we learn in groups of seven new ideas, plus or minus two on average. However, any more than seven will begin to lose track and forget. So the most modern research shows that three, maybe four new items is actually the sweet spot for retention of information and effective learning. The brain chunks this many things when they exist in the same arena, which subsequently allows you to convert that chunk into a single item when expanding your knowledge even further. 
Now, uh, the, this is 10 ideas. So shit, you know what? If you can take seven or even four out of these and take action on them, I'll be happy about it for sure. But this is, this is very true because think about how you think. Like, um, you know, the other day, subconsciously, uh, I was writing out like a format of what I think is the foundation of fitness business and what most, I would say, uh, owners are missing because there's so much lead generation stuff coming out there. And, uh, and I was writing these things down. It just so happens that it was three, right? It's three things, coaching, culture, and customer experience. Those are the three missing link, links that people haven't like done well enough to, maintain, uh, to, to, to build a solid foundation because you can get all the leads and if you don't have those three C's in place, things aren't going to go well. And that's one of the things I'm going to cover in my, my business day here at Vigor. But, but I wanted to bring it back to like that. That's how I thought in those chunks, right? Because I wanted to, to get it down into a simple format that was understandable, not only to somebody else, but to me as well, right? So well, where else do triple C in common? Many widely used acronyms, both for text abbreviation and proper names, comes in threes. IDK, TBH, LOL, IBM, UPS the three C's, right? And almost every major American television network, think about that one, right? Why are, why are the three? Um, what about the Declaration of Independence, the rights of life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness, right? Three, okay? Uh, in popular stories and media, Shakespeare witches in Macbeth, Dickens' three ghosts in A Christmas Carol, Alexander Dumas' three musketeers, um, four if you add, you know, D'Artagnan, but if you watch any sketch comedy show from the 20th and 21st century, you see a large percentage of the skits have three components that build the punchline. Three is already everywhere, so it's worth formulating your own presentation around that number because it's going to make it easier to consume, right? So in writing and speaking, three is more satisfying than any other number. Um, following story, but I'd say up to five, but like, hey, chunk it down to three if possible. So here's a couple of questions and exercises. Keep a journal record of all the places you encounter groups of three for a day or two. Did any of these groups have any impact on you before you even realized they came in three? I would say that you probably do. Go back and look at stuff because this is what, what we're wired to. What are the three most important components of your overarching idea? Three data points, three examples, three stories, etc. Like what are the three? Right, chunk them down, boom, boom, boom. Right, this is this is practice. Hey, if you need to stay, you know what? Like, if you need to stop the podcast right now and go do that, go do that. All right, big idea number six: prepare, rehearse, and converse. And this is one that I feel like, man, this is the deliberate practice. This is the stuff I was talking about the be um, the beginning. Built in biology. Get this. Many surveys have shown that people fear public speaking more than they fear death itself. I mentioned that before. Wild, right? That's, that's crazy. <laughs> and yet, no, literally wild, right? This fear, like many of those built into us, dates to our most primitive selves. In fact, the fear of public speaking, according to an article from Psychology Today, may be directly linked to the fear of death. One of humanity's early defenses against predators that were capable of killing us was to live and operate in groups. Therefore, our tendency to collaborate and live in communities makes it unnatural to get on stage with a spotlight on us, where our weaknesses and frailties can be put on display for all of us. Now, remember that like, we're battling sometimes like thousands of years of evolution and how our brain is wired, you know, and we're trying to change it like this. And this is, this is, what, this is where all these things are coming from. So what can you do to erase the biggest of all fears? And I would tell you, practice. I've, I've talked about this before, right? Like, practice and like even playing things in your head so that like a scary movie with, that you watched over and over and over, the fear loses a grip of you. But I would say practice is even more powerful, right? So the more that you practice, the more you build confidence, the more you overcome that fear. So use the community and group that you won't have when the big presentation comes in advance. This has, of course, already been advised in multiple sections and multiple books and multiple, uh, I would say, you've, I mean, you've probably heard this over and over and over again, right? But I also said in the exercise section, say, hey, get some loved ones and deliver your presentation to them, knowing they'll never try to take advantage of your flaws and failures, hopefully. Um, but I think that in itself is uncomfortable already, but I think that's things that you will, it will help you overcome when you get on a big stage in front of tens or hundreds of people. Seek their feedback. That, then like just wean yourself off of them, like slowly wean yourself off of them, right? Present a few people you know well and more to those you don't. 
right? Because at first, it's more comfortable to talk to somebody that you do know, uh, that at least that you know that they won't judge you and persecute you, right? Because that's what we're afraid of. Um, until it feels natural to express your awesome ideas to strangers. And by the time you get to the big stage, you should feel great. And I do believe this is true because uh, I, I noticed that over the last you know decade plus, um, what I really do when I talk to people, I feel like I'm always kind of presenting my ideas. And because I'm doing it so often, like I could go on stage right now and talk you know, for hours about something because I feel like I'm doing it every week. you know, And, and, and that's how I've built up the practice over thousands of hours, right? Also, practice make, makes comfort. So the goal of practicing and rehearsing shouldn't be to commit the words of your presentation or speech to memory. That's not, that's not what it's about, right? Instead, you want to grow so comfortable with the content that you're able to deliver it almost as a direct conversation with your audience. I, I would say a big part of, you know, what has, what has uh, I would say, speaking in front of video, because I have spoke at like, in, you know, over 100 uh, I would say presentations, whether it was here in the gym, whether it was other events and conferences and whatnot. But what's also allowed me to do that was presentations in front of video, podcasting, um, because I'm doing that. I'm having a conversation with you, right? And to be able to deliver it without having like all these slides and stuff like that. And like, while sometimes I have notes, I'm still like, this is, you know, this is content that I've gone over and over and over to where I'm comfortable talking about it, right? And in fact, this is one of the things that is, especially when you're doing these, I would say, powerful, you know, shorter presentations, it's best to avoid word for word script. Because then the thing is, you, you run the risk of being like robotic, right? Like you're, you're just like, and then it's like, there's no soul to it. We talked about data with soul, right? And you're relying on that too much in the dialogue. So, I mean, obviously, like understanding and knowing your subject is powerful because if some shit goes off the chain, like, it doesn't matter. You can talk about it, right? You know, so there's there's reference in uh, TED Talks and a bunch of the books that I talked about to, you know, presenters who spent hundreds of hours, and I mean, like hundreds of hours rehearsing, right? And, and so one of the things that when I do a presentation for Vigor, let, let's say a lot of times if it's a longer one, it might have like anywhere from 60 to 100 slides. And first of all, I'm building these slides out. As I'm building them out, every slide that I do, I actually will speak it out. You know, I'm just in front of the computer. I'm speaking it out. I'll attach a story to it in my head. If there's a picture, I go over and over and over again. So it might, might take me like 10, 15, 20 hours, you know, to go through one presentation, maybe even more sometimes. And then I'll usually go through it once or twice before I actually do it on stage. Um, so think about that, right? Uh, after a TED Talk musician, Amanda Palmer thanked more than 100 people in her blog for helping her su uh, succeed on stage. You can bet a majority of those folks sat through at least one practice session, right? So, I mean, think about how powerful that is. And, and, and one of the things that I want to improve on is I create a lot of presentations. Uh, and Jay was the person that, hey, listen, you got to cut it down and do fewer presentations, but just keep improving them and making them better and better and better and better. And those are the things that you talk about. And, you know, I... I I certainly have a, a, a vast curiosity of subjects that I think are applicable to my business and, and just the things that I want to improve on. So I think that's why I do that. But he's absolutely right on that, right? But you also want to practice for yourself. And don't just do it in the mirror. Record yourself on video. This is part of the reason, too. Like, I watch through this stuff. Like, when Gene records, you know, presentations and stuff like that, I go over it. And sometimes I cringe. Uh, even starting this, I caught myself saying, right? or like, right, which are some things I might say quite often, but because when I watch over it, I catch myself and I get, oh, I'm like, oh, there I go doing it again. Guess what? I'm going to course correct next time and think about it more, right? So, and remember, all you need is your phone. You can do it with your phone. Pay close attention to your pacing, your gestures, uh, whether your eyes shift to tell that you're thinking, any uh, pauses or fillers, words you use, especially your tone, right? And notice that, like, tonality, right? If, if I was saying this podcast and it was just the same the whole time, right? Like, you'd probably be like, fuck it, I want to get out of here. But you can take people high and then bring it back low and make a point and be more, a little more quiet. Or you can bring some more energy and go a little bit faster. So all those things matter. And obviously, over time, you learn these things, right? But you want to be comfortable and presenting in a constant tone, okay? So most people slow down their rate of speech when they give a speech or presentation, don't deliver a presentation 
have a conversation instead, right? Many a times when I'm doing these things, like I'm literally thinking about communicating and talking to the crowd. Actually, matter of fact, it wasn't that long ago where uh, I had this massive slide ready to present to a six-week challenge audience with about 70 people in the crowd um, that came out. And because of the new laptop, we didn't sync it with the projector and I had to go acapella. And certainly I was like, fuck, like I got all this stuff ready. And uh, man, uh, so I still had a laptop in front of me, but ba I did about an hour and a half, hour 45 off the top of my head because I was having a conversation with the audience. So a couple questions here, right? Record yourself. Take a video on your phone of you delivering a speech and watch for the things listed in the last paragraph, right? So think about where do you need to improve on, okay? Where do you need to improve on? Is it tonality? Is it body language? Is it speed of speech, right? Is it... Have being more prepared and ready and not having any of the uh, uh, mm, pauses, saying um, things like that, right? Point it out, write it down because those, like I said, you're taking notes, you're doing constructive criticism on yourself so you can do it better next time. Find someone who isn't afraid to be critical of you, but whom you trust very much, right? Perform for them and have them hold you accountable for fixing your biggest speech flaws. Know what those are. Eye contact, filler words like um, uh, poor body language, staying too tight notice i speak with my hands a lot i think i got that from my mom but it's just like you want to express that and you don't want to um go above your head with your arms but keeping it up out here about shoulder level and doing things like that are you engaged are you planting around if you're on stage do you go to one side of the stage and look at an individual in their eye and talk to them right because you want to make the audience feel like you're talking to them not glancing through but actually stopping and looking at a certain person and actually being there. There's, a, and there's so many different stuff, uh, th things that there are to learn. Another person to really like, uh, I would say learn from is Roger Love, which is one of the greatest speech coaches. Um, and, and like I said, there's so much information here. And like, these are the things I love learning because I know it's gonna help me. Um, it's gonna help me become a better presenter, better speaker, better storyteller. Last thing, did you forget to say something important? Did you leave out any critical detail that could be uh, that could better explain your idea? Maybe it's a story, right? Make a list of interesting and memorable anecdotes that could improve your next try. And that's where I like. That's where I seek stories. I search for stories that can relate to the things that I want to share, because that's really, really, really powerful. Big idea number seven is teach something new. But first, teach yourself. As we all know by this point, the brain is a complex organ. Sometimes it can even be a little bit hypocritical. When I say a little bit, I mean a lot. So for instance, the brain is generally lazy. It seeks to save energy by doing as little work as possible. And uh, in story brand, you know, uh, there's two points. One is if, if you confuse, you lose, right? The brain does not like complex things. It likes simplicity. If you confuse, you lose. And it doesn't want to burn too many calories. Like too much thinking, too many calories burn. Not good for survival. So this is what I'm talking about here. Some tactics for this are the creation of biases and pattern formation that el eliminate work requiring deliberate thought, right? Too much deliberate thought. No, no bueno. Simultaneously, humans are addicted to exploration. So we actually crave new experiences and new ways of seeing narratives we surround ourselves with. So even though you might have heard something before, I'm always trying to tell a different story for about a same topic. What I mean by that is people learn in different ways. Uh, you know, so when somebody says, well, Luca, like how many times are you going to tell this, uh, you know, share this one thing about nutrition that people like need to get better at or, you know, would be good for them to get better at to succeed. And I just find different ways and different narratives to set to, to sell that. Right. So in order to talk with this fine line of having an impact on the brains of your audience members, start by doing some exploration of your own. Ben Saunders is the youngest man to ever ski to the North Pole. He delights in traveling to the coldest regions of the earth all alone. At times during his journeys, there uh, there's, isn't a single other person within 2,000 miles of him. That's pretty freaky and scary considering that most people freak out if they're like 20 miles from any human beings. And the thing is, there isn't much to be earned from, uh, from these journeys. There isn't much else to be discovered about these desolate ice wastelands. Saunders actually credits his will to do so to his addiction for exploration. In fact, he equals the danger and habitual nature of this tendency to crack addiction. Right? And this, we talked actually I, in a previous podcast, we talked about basically being in, uh, 
alone and how the power of being alone and what that does for you and, and how important that is, right? But when you, so li- first of all, listen to Saunders' TED Talk. It's a f- fantastic talk. But it was met with praise simply because he's pushed humanity to its limits in seeking what capacity we have for strength, survival, and the ability to exist in solitude. He has himself become an anomaly whose story audiences are fascinated by. Even though that's something that people like kind of know, right? Like it's, oh, like I knew that told in this format, told in this story. So it's different. Now it might, might click for you. So the more someone encounters different and new experiences like Saunders does, the greater their creative aptitude grows, allowing them to formulate novel ideas and solutions. You know, back in the day, like uh, me and Dax Moy were talking about this as far as like the more experiences that you have yourself, the more things that you do, guess what? It helps you because you have more stories, you have more perspectives, you're more, so like that, that's definitely encouraging you to just go out and do shit, right? Like you could read every book and like, I'm a human, you guys know, like I'm, I'm a voracious reader. I love reading, but if you don't do stuff, man, then you don't have stories, right? Eclectism also helps just like exploring the world and expanding your cultural and geographical knowledge, you know, creates more creativity. So does, you know, expanding your intellectual expertise. And so formal education tends to push most people in the direction of specializing in a, a, I was saying a singular discipline by studying a major, perhaps alongside a minor. And that's kind of what I did. Like I actually went the business route because I was like, ah, fuck it, you got to know business. But I was really, like, I was really intrigued and curious about the body, which is why I took minor in exercise science kinesiology, right? But remember that some of the most successful and famous individuals from history have achieved such status specifically because they flouted this convention and they, they went across multiple like disciplines. And when people ask me, like, why are you doing so many different things is because of the key of the connecting the dots. Now, this is my inspiration. OK, is Leonardo da Vinci, one of the greatest artists of all time was much, actually much more than a painter. And hopefully you, you, you know about that. But he was lucky enough to live in Florence during a peak time of exploration in both the arts and sciences. And his ability to navigate the two spheres and its major purveyors was as he's predominantly known for today. And if you go back, so for instance, The Talent Code, which is a great book written um, by Daniel Coyle, who also wrote The Culture Code, one of my favorite books lately, talked about why there was so many people from Florence that you know, in a short time frame, there was more, um, I would say, world-known artists that came out of this small place, which is only a couple hours drive away from, from where I was born, and, um, and why, like, why that was so. And it was a big part of it, this whole talent co was that, you know, they were apprenticing for masters, and they, were, they had to apprentice for a decade before they'd even get to do real work. Uh, and that was part of the reason. But Leonardo da Vinci came from there and came from that. And so... Um, Steve Jobs often cited a deep interest in the intersection of liberal arts and technology, right? And so just just how I would say Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci, I mean, he was like an artist, he was a sculptor, he was, uh, you know, he created inventions and uh, he had all these thought processes. I mean, there's, he went a wide range of things that he did. Um, Steve Jobs, he sought for a way to enhance humanistic development and growth through the advancement and popularization of technology. But, you know, today you can see clearly how this has come through in Apple's products and the company's role in bringing computing to the individual. But it's all, but it's like connecting the dots. And I think that a lot of people will go like, well, go niche. And I've talked about this before, like going niche versus, you know, going a little wider and then you're better at connecting the dots. So when you introduce a new or novel way of solving an old problem, you're tapping into millions of years of that adaptation. And just know that like that's something that's worth thinking about, right? When you're when you're doing you know, when you're studying stuff or hearing stuff and you feel like you got a novel angle, like write that stuff down. Right? So what scientific disciplines interest you the most? What other disciplines do these tend to cross paths with the most? So like, for instance, for me, it was like, think about coaching, how it all started. Coaching started for me in like training, like understanding the science of the human body. And, 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 and for instance, the different specific adaptation principles that happen. So you go into program design and movement and biomechanics and, and power outputs and things like that, right? But then it starts being about like, what about the mental aspect of it? What about the recovery aspect of it? What are all these different things? What about environments, right? What about social sciences and communities, right? All these things play a factor in the coaching. And so 
that's how I started delving into them because I was so intrigued by like, yeah, you could know all this stuff, but if you don't understand like human emotion, if you don't un- understand, you know, if you're not compassionate, empathetic, if you don't have great communication skills, if you don't understand creating environments and how to influence people and so on and so forth, right? Behavior change, change psychology. Man, I can't be the best at, the, you know, helping somebody change, but it also gave me these different perspectives now that I could communicate with the audience with, okay? So ask yourself that. Which are less likely to be related and how can you learn more about those disciplines? Because that's gonna help you when you're presenting. It's gonna help you to give different ideas and different viewpoints. Here's the thing. Pick up a book that you'd traditionally be unlikely to read. Uh, I do that pretty often now, but I didn't used to. It was like very, very one, one-sided. And I've started, for instance, reading more, uh, I would say, nonfiction stuff that, um, and even even fiction and storytelling stuff that's got nothing to do with like personal development or books that are giving you information, um, which was important for me, right? Perfect example, if you're the kind that likes self-help books, try out something on art or history and some narrative nonfiction, right? If you tend to stick with nonfiction, try a novel. Those things, and I, I promise it will help because at the beginning I was like, man, how, how this is going to help me out, right? And then I started, I learned a lot about storytelling. I learned a lot about, you know, whether it was stories or whether it was history. And it was, oh, wow, I didn't know that. How can you connect the dots now in your next presentation? Hey, maybe you're t- talking to about something about change and you can plug in a story about history. Powerful. Go on a trip. Go to a new p- to part of town that you haven't been yet. Because I say go on a trip. Some people might be like, oh, man, can't go on a trip. But it's like rediscovering. I stayed on 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 uh, Saturday. I went and checked into the Pan Pacific down in Seattle to do a bunch of work, and then I started walking around late at night and early in the morning and just rediscovering Seattle. Right? If you have the resources, travel to a new city, state, country, or continent. Just travel and meet people while you do. You'd say you'd think like, well, what, what does that have to do with presenting? And it's a lot to do with presenting because I have stories from everywhere, right? And you have different perspectives and you're able to better share and connect with people those things that you want to get across. All right, so we got a couple more powerful ones. Actually, these are, these are really, really important. This is uh, emotionally charged moments. That's the big idea number eight. Uh, if you guys have watched uh, the Bill Gates TED Talk, there's a mosquito moment, right? So when an event elicits strong emotion within us, that moment in time can quite literally be stamped into our brains. And we talked about these, like emotionally charged moments, high or low, meaning uh, emotional in a good way and a bad way, right? Small details out of day-to-day life rarely get brought up in our memories, but things that cause intense fear, joy, shock, or euphoria will last in our minds. This is due to a neurochemical reaction in our brains in which dopamine is released, enhancing our information processing abilities in that moment. So. You probably remember your first kiss because it made you intensely happy. I would hope so. Maybe it made you disgusted and you remember it because of that. Your first time getting pulled over because it made you nervous or upset, a significant family event, a relocation, a divorce, the announcement of a, you know, a new child uh, because it shocked you. I mean, you, we can keep going, right? Traumatic events. Um, and one of my favorite talks in, 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 in TED Talk history is when Bill Gates released a bunch of mosquitoes into the crowd at the start of his speech in 2009. So naturally, this concerned and frightened people for a moment as this topic was the prevalence of malaria in Africa. So imagine that, right? Like, I mean, the natural reaction of that fear, that threat, it it triggers you and it gives you an emotional response. However, he quickly eased the tension by affirming that they were malaria-free mosquitoes, which obviously you'd hope that. Uh, And and after that received, you know, laughter and applause, uh, because people were like, thank God. so, and, and Gates is not known for being particularly charismatic, right? And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen him uh, do, you know, dance or, or do anything of that nature. I actually bumped into him one time in, um, in Daniel's Broiler, if, of, of all places. Uh, but he knows how to hack the attention of an audience to make impactful, memorable moments. Actually, it's definitely a, a, good, uh, a good video to go check out. So, surprising, but this is what the success of many presentations comes down to, a singular, wow, moment, Right? that sticks in the mind of the audience forever simply because that moment is heightened emotion and dopamine release. Now, it's not worth trying to insert these extra special moments throughout a speech, and it's, it's honestly, it's not necessary. As long as your message is significant and urgent enough that there is like, a, oh, no, or what's going on, or yay, right? 
will lock the meat and potatoes of the presentation in the minds of listeners for a long, long time, right? So is there a moment in time where people go like, oh shit, like they get it, right? And the most effective place to include your wow moment is towards the end. If not, if the, like the finale, like this is what you leave people with, okay? Um, though Bill Gates did it first, it's more likely that people will become distracted by their heightened emotions this way. So instead, you can send people off from your speech with that dopamine still flowing after having delivered those important ideas. This can be especially effective when performing or presenting within the constraints of something like a stringent format like TED Talks or if, you know, uh, I, I did Warrior X, well, Warrior X, which was basically like um, the warrior, wake up vo- warrior version of TEDx Talks. Uh, which <laughs> I, I, I was able to finagle it even though my presentation was certainly a, a longer than, uh, than the 20 minutes. Uh, but things like TED Talks, you know, uh, venture capital presentations, pitches, uh, like it's actually one that I did for, um, uh, for uh, US Bank for our loan, which I'll talk about at the end. But if you're forced to follow certain conventions, make them remember an unconventional twist by wrapping your presentation with a surprise Think of it as a bow at the end, right? It's a surprise like, voila, here you have it. And then people take that big idea and that's powerful. So an emotionally charged event is the best process kind of external stimulus ever measured. Um, and it's important to think about those things when you're presenting. So questions. Have you ever been wowed at a performance or presentations? What emotions did you feel? I think it's powerful to study what made you move and like that punchline, that bow, that wow, right? And so write it out, like write it out. What did you feel and what was it? Like study it. Now for you, formulate some potential kind of like mosquito or wow moments, okay? I would even like, you know, what, what's great if, you, if you're a gym owner, if you're a business owner, you have a weekly stage to be able to do that. And that might be a team meeting that might be um, at the end of a group training session of a charity boot camp. So what emotions will your presentation appeal to in these moments, Maybe it's a powerful reflection. It might be, um, you know, uh, a feeling of community, whatever it may be. What kinds of props might you need to execute, execute the perfect emotionally charged event? Now, if you're presenting, you know, maybe you need a prop. Uh, maybe you bring out mosquitoes, maybe you don't. But the point of it is that like, hey, you got to think about that stuff. And, and when you do, when you prepare for it, like there's going to be a much different, uh, I would say, result than if you just, if you don't and you just kind of go with it. And big idea number nine, dynamic presentation, vocal power. We talked about this throughout this and I've said it and mentioned it before, but have you, you know, have you ever seen Tony Robbins on stage? Man, he's like a giant ball of lightning. He's always moving, always changing vocal tone, gesturing here and there and addressing his audience directly and looking them in the eye and bringing things up and then bringing the music out and then bringing it down and going to a person individually and maybe bringing his tone down, right? He's taking you on a journey and I think that's what's important too, tonality and when you're speaking so it's not just flat and all across, pauses. I did that on purpose, by the way. So if you, his first TED Talk is amongst the most viewed of all time. It was one of the first ever given recorded. TED fanatics consider it a classic in the canon, right? He's one of the most revered and watched speakers of all times. I would actually say perhaps the most viewed inspirational speaker of all time. Um, And and because he's, I would say, because of his predecessor and probably some of his mentors and peers like the Jim Rohns and stuff, like, you know, he's had the internet and he's gone for so long. And that's what I admire about that guy. Just, if you look at his body of work, it's insane. I mean, I was, what is it, a year ago? Probably a year ago, he, he was in Seattle. And it's, it's just crazy. His energy is just crazy. I had actually friends with me that are non rah rah, non woo woo. Uh, I'm, you know, hopefully you know what I mean by that. That at the end we're just jumping out of their seats, hugging people. So I mean, when somebody can do that, it's incredible, right? And Tony Robbins is a six foot seven uh, with a massive build, and his voice is deep as you'd imagine such as body, uh, you know, uh, such a person with that body would have, and he does. Um, but it's Robin's ability to manipulate his voice is one of the most important and impressive aspects of his style. First of all, yes, he has a power in his vocal cords that it possesses a naturally king-like authority. And he's actually, he works, uh, he's worked with his, his vocal coaches, Roger Love, who I mentioned, who has a book out, who has a course called The Perfect Voice, which I've gone through and I, and I, and I work on uh, pretty consistently. Um, but, in, you know, and he has that in any given seminar presentation, but he alters his cadence his volume, his tone, 
and his vocal direction constantly, right? It might be higher pitched or it might go deeper and it might like you're, you're changing, you're taking people through a journey. So watch when he asks his audience a question. He makes it clear he expects a response and he energizes the speed and volume of his words in the direction of that response. So when he addresses somebody individually, he speaks clearly and confidently and directly, right? Every moment of his vocal presentation helps establish the feeling that he wants his audience to feel. This is really important, okay? And uh, to move, like also, there, there's, a, there, there's an author that has a TED Talk, it's really good, Amy Cuddy, and she's also one of the most, uh, I would say, um, watched, I would say, TED Talk speakers. And she just delivered a speech on the power of body language, the research of which eventually ended up helping formulate the book Presence, which is a great book. Uh, one of Cuddy's main claims is the benefit of power posing. Power posing includes standing in a way that expands your body and extremities, essentially looking like classic Superman for several minutes. Now, you can actually see me hunched over right now, and it's changing my physiology. It's just changing my chemistry. It really is. So I'm hunched over like now because this is probably a little more comfy position. But if I'm up here, this is my, my power pose. This is my Superman pose. And studies actually shown that it changed your hormone, hormone levels, right? Uh, and so she suggested doing this anytime you need a confidence boost, perhaps before a presentation or before a meeting, someone knew that may be important. Like you could actually stand a certain way and it's going to boost your confidence. It's been proven, right? Her research has found that power pose increased hormonal production, which subsequently boosted the, bo the poser's performance. So if you're all crunched over in this kind of position, uh, like it shows that you actually like reduce confidence. But if you're upright and like this, it actually increases your confidence, which is crazy, right? And uh, akin to the power pose is the power sphere. The power sphere represents the space around you within which the motion of your arms and torso communicate the most power. I mentioned this a little bit earlier as far as like talking with your hands. One of the purposes of rehearsing a speech is to allow your body to be freed from your mind. The more your words flow naturally, the better your gestures will freely correspond with what you're saying, which helps to emphasize your points. Because I might say, you know, like this and like bring it in and like, so I'm emphasizing something with my hands, right? It's important though to keep the tabs on those gestures and make sure they stay within the power sphere. It's a circle that extends vertically from just below your waist to the tip of your nose and horizontally between both your arms outstretched with your elbows slightly bent. So like I said, there's this sphere, right, that you stay in and you don't want to go out of that sphere because <laughs> then you look like you're going crazy, right? You want to have control. So no, I, like actually I do this subconsciously, but I stay in this sphere. I've practiced this sphere, um, but that's what matters. So the way you carry yourself actually changes the way you feel when you're delivering your presentation and that's important. So strike a pose, damn it. Try power posing for a few minutes before your, your next difficult event, or maybe even it's like a meeting or you know, you're speaking at a meeting, a date, presentation, something similar, right? Just try it for shits and giggles. I promise you, you will feel better. Next time you have a conversation, dramatize your voice a little bit, like no shame. Use a greater range of volume, dynamics, pause, and try to depict your emotions and deliver your tone. So like, we would actually do this, uh, this thing at Jay's Place where we'd pick out uh, different uh, motivational quotes. Like for instance, I remember last time I did church, uh, Winston Churchill's one, and he would pick out different emotions for me to read that through. So it'd be angry, so I'd be reading it in anger. The next time you have a damn conversation, dramatize your voice a little bit, right? And then it'd be like sad. <laughs> the next time you have a conversation, <laughs> Oh, just dramatize your voice a little bit. Or happy. Hey, the next time you have a conversation, man, just dramatize your voice, right? So, and that's practice. So you're practicing different tonalities, different feelings, different emotions. And it really helps you out with this stuff. I mean, you can become really, like, like I said, this is all practice, guys. It's all practice, okay? Do the same with your gestures. Be more expressive with your hands in the next conversation you have. Try to illustrate what you're saying with your emotions just to see how that feels, Right, so use, like if I'm saying just a little bit, a smidge bit, notice how I'm using my hands, right? I'm communicating with my hands. So, so do that because it's, it's, it's powerful, okay? And last but not least, but this is important, is the big idea number 10, which is stay in your lane, be you, right? We just talked about Tony Robbins. He's one of the greatest of all time, that's a fact, right? He's probably inspired hundreds of millions of people in his motivational speaking career. 
And yet the final tip for being a better public speaker is this. Don't be Tony Robbins. Well, don't try to be Tony Robbins because you aren't him, right? You have a different voice and body from him. You have different life experience and different interest in him. Even if it's your goal to be a motivational speaker just like him or as I would say influential as him, you must learn to develop your own unique presentation voice based on your own personal characteristics and style. And that's actually that uniqueness is what's powerful because when you try to be somebody else, you're just, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll never, like put it this way, you'll never be the best version of somebody else. You're, you'll always be the best version of you, right? Nobody else can be you, but you can be a secondary version of someone else, which is no bueno. Um, Rich Rodman is another highly su- successful speaker and he runs a public speaking coaching service worth looking into. Uh, he's been like through the, through the ringer of like venture capital funding presentations um, and was also elected president of San Francisco Toastmasters International Chapter. And uh, Toastmasters actually is, you know, one of the things I do highly recommend. I did it for a while in college um, is when it comes to public speaking, like groups and being able to get better at speaking and have an audience and constructive criticism and things of that nature. So I'd, I'd highly recommend that. Um, but rather than exude energy at consistently high rate, Rodman can serve his gest- gestures for sh- essential moments in his speeches so that listeners have no doubt when something is important. I think that's a really, really good note too. I'm usually pretty high energy. Um, and sometimes what I do, I do the exact opposite. I'm like higher energy and I stop and pause when something is important, right? There's different ways of doing it, but this is his way. So his pace is consistent. He tends to keep his tone low so that he can, c- contains, uh, maintains a constant kind of like, I would say air of authority. Though of course, if you want to be like Robin Robbins, You'll need to get out there and speak first. I said that right at the beginning, the frequency of speaking, right? Then and only then can you determine what what techniques make the most sense for you. Because it is kind of like, I would say, um, you find your groove. You find what's natural to you. You're already probably doing some of these things yourself. Um, It's important that you understand how many people are seriously afraid, like deathly afraid of public speaking. Like I said, look... I say this from a standpoint of like, man, rewind. So let me see. I was 20. Rewind like literally about 16 years, you know, 16 years ago, 17 years ago. And I mean, I would be physically shaking when I had to present out in front of 15, 20 people in a class. Like people actually kind of knew, you know what I mean? So not only do tons of people truly fear the podium more than they fear death, but many famous, wildly successful types feel this way too. One of the wealthiest men in the world, I hope you know him, Warren Buffett, whose life and decision at this point is largely in the public eye, has admitted that he gets anxiety about speaking. Even Rich Rodman, who I just talked about, dedicated an entire portion of, uh, of a course to dealing with the nerves when it comes to speaking. Okay, So at the end of the day, you can always change your mind. Now, of course, it isn't that simple. right? If it was, it'd be like, all right, guys. Peace out, leave here, be a great speaker, and just, you know, just go on stage. Uh, but there is much psychological research that confirms the benefit of thinking positive thoughts and actively reinforcing your own success. It's called reframing, right? Practicing positive self-talk, especially when the going gets tough. Like that's, you know, we talked about that, right? Like don't listen to yourself, but talk to, your, talk to yourself more, listen to yourself less. Meaning that like give yourself positive affirmation and don't listen to that, I would say, negative editor in your head. Okay. Um, you, you, the spoiler alert is you're more likely to go and attract negative energy from detractors, non-believers, pessimists, people that talk shit like that don't, you know, I mean, that's what happens, right? You, you put out big things and then people that are uncomfortable about you doing big things will try to bring you down. Sometimes it's like subtle. Sometimes it's subtle. It's not like really like direct or like, oh, you can't make it it's subtle. It's a subtle pull and you got to pay attention to that. So no matter, you know, don't no matter to them. Instead, remind yourself of the value of your ideas. Remind yourself of the value that you get to bring to the world and what you're capable of. Um, like we established in the first idea, the first point that we said, hey, the world needs your ideas. They need the shit that your, your skill sets. They need your, your value, right? And your intellect. Don't back down. Strike a damn pose that we talked about. Like, man, get into that power pose, Step on stage and, and, and kill it and get after it. So you can learn from others and how they achieve success in public speaking, but you'll never make a lasting impression on people unless you leave your own mark. And I believe you can leave your own mark. And 
the last questions I'm going to leave you guys with is, hey, after all the practice and recording you've done by yourself and with others, what's your unique body language style? Find that out. What's your unique vocal style? How do you speak and present when talking about something that excites you? How do you speak and present when delivering hard facts? How can your unique style be applied to creating a special wow moment? Ask yourself that. Like this should be something like this podcast, this episode should be something you go back to because one, it, it, it reminds you of these points. Uh, it gives you ideas. It gives you some inspiration. But nothing matters. Like I, I challenge you right now, a couple of things, right? A couple of things. I challenge you to shoot a video of yourself today. I challenge you if you've done some speaking to like to set up a presentation in the next week, two, three weeks. Um, I got two coming up in the next, just the next month. One, we have a Joel Jameson event here at my, uh, my gym. I'm doing one or two speaking presentations. Um, I'm doing a kickoff launch part uh, seminar that's gonna be based on nutrition, mindset, lifestyle for the gym. Uh, and matter of fact, a little bit more than 30 days, I'm doing a full day event that I actually haven't even, uh, uh, I would say officially put out yet for a uh, one day business coaching here at Vigor with a 30 day follow up. So that's, you know, in five weeks, three speaking engagements um, and probably, I don't know, 50 more videos shot. But hey, it doesn't matter where you are. It just matters that you're doing more and you're doing better. So what is what is it you're going to do? Set up a speaking gig. You got a, you got a facility, you got a, a fitness business, set up, set up a speaking engagement. It's going to give you a deadline to get ready for. Do it in three weeks, do it in four weeks, do it in two weeks. Um, you know, a, a lunch and learn, speaking at a business, like presenting on something that you're passionate about, an idea that you have, and just ask your friends to sit in. Go to a team meeting, like your own, if you're, if you're an owner, go to a team meeting and present on something. Do it 18 minutes, like put a TED Talk together for your people. Right, do something. Take action. Okay. Promise. Deal. All right. With that said, okay. As always, guys, I always, uh, I really appreciate. It. I love your support, and I love when you guys, you know, go to iTunes, give a five star review. You know, share your thoughts on it. Spread the word because once again, like this is helping other people, and if it helps just one other person, take action and do something and build their competence and skill set, improve their life, improve their business, then we're winning. So I encourage you to do that. And I thank you for doing that. And I will see you in the next episode of Rigor Life Podcast. Coach Lucas out. Peace.